we just finished up talking about grid search. And that grid search uh, mechanism that we've been using with scikit-learn is all about trying to make choices about hyperparameter sets. However, we have the next level of problem that we need to be able to solve. So we've, we've talked about that first bullet. Uh, the other one is this problem of the model bake-off. And what I mean by that is that I want to be able to uh, take ridge regression and set it uh, next to uh, lasso and set it next to, uh, say, decision tree regression and make statistically valid comparisons amongst these, uh, amongst these different algorithms. One of the challenges that we have in doing this is if we, if we just use this same validation set that we use to select our hyperparameters uh, to, to do the comparisons across the different models, one of the risks that we run is that uh, we could be overfitting our hyperparameters. And again, with overfit, the implication is that uh, we may not perform well with future data. Really want to be able to address both of these levels with independent data. So from hyperparameters to model selection, we want to be able to uh, uh, use different data for making those two choices. And we want to have multiple samples of our performance metric at, at each of the levels. With our grid search, we certainly were doing that with, when we were setting that cross-validation parameter to 20. Uh, we were getting 20 different performance metrics. That gives us a distribution that allows us to nicely compare across different hyperparameter choices. We want to have access to a distribution of performance metrics also when we go to set ridge regression against uh, decision tree regression. And with the standard way that uh, the book talks about it and what we see a lot on the net is that we actually hold out, before we do any hyperparameter selection, we hold out uh, a subset of the available data to use as a single test set. And, uh, and this is problematic because when we go to evaluate our, uh, our models and compare them against each other, we only have that one test set to, to work with. So we get one performance metric. And, and so this doesn't really allow us to, to talk in a statistically valid way about the differences between these two model types. So what we're gonna do is make a modification to the way we're doing the splits in cross-validation. We're, we're not going to have uh, just uh, two different uh, types of data. We're going to have three. We'll have uh, training data, and this is all about fitting the model. We'll have validation data, which is about uh, doing hyperparameter selection. And then we have test data that we'll use for measuring, uh, measuring the performance of our models uh, at the very end for comparison across mo model types. So I want to show you the big picture first with both levels of uh, hyperparameter selection and uh, model comparison. And then we'll delve down uh, into uh, this holistic uh, cross-validation idea. So we want to, we have, uh, say we have our uh, ridge regression model with an, uh, that we want to be comparing uh, against, uh, against lasso uh, versus, uh, versus using uh, deci decision tree regression. And, and what I mean by this, this word bake off, we want to compare uh, these, these three different model types. In, in order to do this in a statistically valid way, I need to have some number of performance metrics so that we have a sense of what the distribution of performance looks like from each one of these. But before I, I can do this comparison, it's important for us to make choices about the parameters. So I might have an alpha of uh, 100 here, and, and in lasso, I might have an alpha of 001 or something along those lines. Decision tree regression, we, we might have a max depth uh, parameter. Uh, we could also uh, have a min entropy. And whatever that parameter might, might be. In, in order to 
in, in order to, uh, to make this choice about an alpha of 100, I need to try out all of my different hyperparameters. So, so I might have an alpha of one. So this is sort of going along the, the path that we just uh, did with our, uh, with our grid search. So, so we have to be able to do a competition across all of these uh, parameters here uh, in order to make the choice of the max uh, performing one that we can then uh, compare against the uh, the other models in the in the grand competition, and and what we've just finished talking about was that this this decision about which one of the hyperparameters is correct, uh, the correct one to use versus which model type is the correct one to use. Um, th these performance statistics need to be independent of uh, one another. All right, so that's the big picture. Let's, let's go ahead and formulate our cross-validation. So, so we've talked before about taking our, our data and chopping it up into some number of folds. So, so I'm, I'm going to label these 0, 1, 2, three, et cetera, and then this is uh, uh, n minus one here, n minus two here, n minus three here. So what this holistic cross-validation approach does is it says, let's take, we're going, we're going to do n different rotations of the data. And for each one of these rotations, we're going to construct a model and then uh, test that performance with, uh, in this case, not one data set, but two different data sets. So rotation zero, we're going to use data uh, from uh, the folds zero through n minus one. We're going to use that for training. N minus two, we're going to use this for validation. And N minus one, we're going to use for testing. So, so, the, so the result of just this one uh, rotation is that we get a model and then we get to know how we do on, the, on our validation set and we, we can compute how we, well we do on the test set. Now, a very important point here is that uh, we were not allowed to look at that test set performance until the very last stage where we're actually comparing the different models. So it, it turns out to be convenient to compute it in, in line here, uh, but uh, you as the uh, practitioner should not actually be looking at that data. The only data you should look at as far as making choices about hyperparameters that should be with respect to this validation data set. Okay, so then rotation one, oops, uh, looks like this. Uh, we're going to use data sets uh, one to uh, n minus two for training. We'll use this one for validation. So this is n minus one here. And then this one that we hadn't, that, that we skipped, this is uh, fold zero, we're going to use this for testing purposes. And then we just continue on through the rotation. So rotation uh, two, we're going to start training on fold two and we're going to use all the way to n minus one. So two to n minus one here. And validation is here. And testing is in the one point, one position. We can continue this rotation process uh, a total of n times before we loop back on to ourselves. The key, the key point here, though, is that 
a, a single data point uh, in all of our data set will only be used for validation at exactly once in one rotation. And that same point will only be used for testing in, uh, in one rotation. And in fact, it will be a different rotation than uh, the validation set. So how, how we might compute this in, uh, uh, in Python, we can certainly talk about a, a range of values. So, uh, so su suppose I am on uh, my rotation is rotation five, then the, let's call it data training, the, or these, let's actually, let's call it folds training. is going to be equal to plus r, and we're going to all take a mod of this. Okay, so, so this range here, this is going to give me a list of zero to n minus one. We're taking that list and adding it to whatever rotation number that we're on, whether it's five or, or zero or seven or what have you. And, and then we're taking that and computing the, the, um, the value, those values mod n. So this, this is going to address our, uh, our, our uh, wrap around when we get to uh, a fold n, that wraps back around to fold zero. Folds validation is just equal to n minus two plus r, and that is also mod n. And folds training is equal to n minus one plus r uh, mod n. So I'm sorry, folds training, that's folds testing. So when uh, r is equal to zero, then this evaluates to n minus one. So let's assume that n is uh, 20 here. So, so that's going to evaluate to 19, 19 mod 20, is uh, equal to 19, and and that's what we had. Uh, that's what we had here. We had our test set assigned to uh, point 19 here, or fold 19. When r is equal to one, n minus one plus one is equal to 20. 20 mod 20 is zero, and that is this test set right here, that's, that's the zero uh, fold. R equal to one, I'm sorry, R is equal to two, then uh, N minus one plus two is equal to 21, mod 20 gives us a one, and that's this case here. The, the same math works for each of these other two uh, cases, for the, for the uh, validation folds, for the training folds, it's just a little bit more complicated because we're maintaining a, uh, a an entire list of folds that we'll be using in the training process. All right, so this is very quick math for figuring out which of your n folds go into each of the sets of training, validation, and test, depending upon which rotation you're on. And of course, that rotation uh, goes from zero up to 19. Okay, so now what we can do is draw a grid here that is uh, rotation by hyperparameter. And we talked at one point about how uh, it's convenient to be able to think about all of the different sets of hyperparameters as one long line. That's this case here. So, so in the case of 
uh, elastic net, this might, this hyperparameter set might be uh, an alpha of 0.01 and so this first row might be alpha of 0.1 and an L1 ratio of uh, 0 0.1, 0.01 and 0.1. The next one might be alpha of 0.01 and L1 ratio of, uh, of 0.5 and on down the line, we get to the end of 0.01, L1 ratio of 0.9. Uh, and then, and then we'll move on to the next possibilities for alpha. So 0 0.1, L1 uh, uh, ratio of uh, 0.1, uh, etc. So we've just we've just unwound that grid of possible uh, hyperparameters into a single line here. So so each one of these corresponds to one row in this uh, in this grid here. Uh, and then we have our rotation of 0, 1, 2, 3, uh, et cetera, down to n minus 1. And for each, for each cell, so let's, let's choose, say, this cell right here. Uh, for each cell, we, we have defined now a training set a validation and a test set, so and, and a set of hyperparameters. So we're going to train train our model uh, using the hyperparameters. And the training set. And then measure performance. Uh, for our validation set. And then finally measure performance uh, for our test set. Okay, and, and, and what we do in the next step here, it's really important to remember you're only allowed to look at the validation set performance. Uh, as soon as you look at the test set performance, it becomes part of the validation process and it's no longer independent. Um, but again, it's, it's convenient since you already have trained up the model right then and there to measure your uh, performance of your test set. So, so the outcome of this really, you can think of this as an, uh, two matrices, uh, one Uh, one that is uh, the validation performance and the other that is the test performance. Sorry, I'm writing a little bit too fast here. All right, so once, once we've done this, then we can go about uh, computing statistics uh, over our validation performance. So I'm going to just work in line in uh, this matrix that we've already uh, computed. Um, for, for this particular choice of hyperparameter values, we can look at the validation set performance uh, across all of the rotations. Let me go ahead and make a copy of all of this. So we have space to work in. All right, so, so we have validation performance for all of these grid uh, locations. For all, all possible rotations. And from here, we can start to compute uh, statistics. We can ask what the mean performance is. If we want to, we can also compute standard deviation. Um, we can also look at the full distribution if that becomes important. But but the really the key one that we're going to be looking at is this mean performance for this particular set of hyperparameters. And then we just walk down this uh, this grid. So for 
Uh, for these guys here, we also compute a mean performance. And that corresponds to this set of hyperparameters, uh, et cetera. So exactly how we choose our hyperparameter set, uh, we, uh, the, the typical thing to do is to ask uh, of all of these, typical thing to do is to ask what is the max of all of these? And we'll declare this as the ideal uh, hyperparameters. One might also care about other kinds of statistics. We, we, we might care about uh, what the median is. We might care about uh, what the min performance is. Uh, it depends on what kind of problem we're trying to solve, but the, the typical thing and the thing that we always do in my lab is to uh, compute the, the max across all of these mean performance metrics. Okay, so, so once we've uh, computed the max over these mean performances, uh, that gives us some sort of an ideal hyperparameter set. So that might, might be this set right here. And then it's this hyperparameter set that, uh, that we uh, get to advance to the next level of competition, this bake-off between marks. So at that point, we can go back to our, uh, our matrix of test set performance. So this is test set performance. And find the row that corresponds to the one that we chose over here. So this was alpha of 0.01 and L1 ratio of 0.9. Usually move that up because that is, yeah. So at that point, we can extract all of these performance values. And then use these to, uh, to compare against the other models. Again, I'm going, to, I'm going to say it one more time. Uh, you're not allowed to look at aspect, these, this part of the matrix or this part of the matrix here. It's only this one row that has been selected. And if you're not, if you're not careful, if, if you do look at it, you do taint the, the whole process. OK, we'll, we'll talk in the next video about this comparison process. But I did want to mention one other uh, one other thing in constructing these rotations. Um, we, we did some experiments uh, early on when we were looking at, uh, at the linear regression uh, object that, that uses that normal equation to compute uh, the set of parameters for your linear model. Um, and one of the experiments that we tried was, uh, was that we tried giving our models uh, different numbers of training, uh, different numbers of training folds. So, so for a lot of our examples, we've given only one training fold, uh, and what we noticed about the the pure linear regression approach was that we tended to dramatically overfit the data. But as we increase the number of training folds that were available to the model, uh, the performance on an independent data set actually improved. So let me show you uh, quickly how that rotation uh, looks. Okay, so we have our, our data set again, and fold 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, et cetera, down to n minus 2 and n minus 1. And for, the, for rotation 0, what we said was these first 0 to uh, n minus three were available for training. 
and the next one was uh, validation, and the last one was test uh, data. Now, if we want to do an experiment where, uh, where we want to vary the amount of training data for rotation zero, uh, we're going to select that training data from this, uh, from this set zero to n minus three and leave validation and test uh, uh, in the same location. So in particular, let's, let's assume that uh, that we're going to use uh, three folds for training. Train, training. Then uh, what we do is use zero, one, and two for the training process. And this is, again, this is rotation zero and we keep validation and test in the same location. So, so validation comes from here at N minus two, and test comes from here, which is N minus one. Rotation one looks just the same. We just shift everybody over to the right, wrapping around. So rotation one gets these three here. So one, two, and three. Validation gets n minus one, and testing gets zero. If we instead had uh, let's say six folds, then rotation zero looks like this. We have zero, one, two, three, four, and five, which is right there. So this is zero, one, two, three, four, and five. Validation is right here at n minus two. And at n minus one, we have test. And again, everything shifts over. When we get to rotation one, we shift everything over by one plus the, the wraparound. Right. When, when you do things in this way, it, uh, it becomes uh, much easier to make comparisons against, uh, make comparisons um, between the different cases where you have uh, different amounts of uh, training data. So our, our model that we, that we generated uh, in rotation zero uses this validation set uh, for the threefold case, it's the same validation set for for rotation zero. In the sixfold case, it's the same one for the n minus two fold case. Uh, so that that allows us to use more paired statistics to to do comparisons across these if if we need to do that. There, there are a variety of other choices that one can make here, uh, but this actually gives you the uh, the cleanest uh, uh, results. Okay, so that's so that is our holistic approach to uh, to doing uh, cross validation. We will uh, talk a little bit more about uh, about comparing of models here in a moment, uh, and then in your homework, you'll get a chance to actually go out and and implement this cross validation approach.